You fight for your brother. You're not fighting for your teammate, you're fighting for your brother. And I think that that was the strength of that team. No, I didn't want to leave Arsenal, but at one point you became to be a, a start to be a little bit toxic. You literally did have your brother joining you. It was the best moment of my career, I will say, you know, having Yaya with me. You were banned for six months for, for substance abuse. It was hard. It was really, really hard. And when you have setbacks, you have to fight and wake up and then carry on going. We can't talk about your time at City without talking about Aguero. <laughs> oh, it was special, it was special. When uh, Aguero scored that goal, you know, deep inside you feel like, you know, I'm part of it. We just bring belief to the fans, belief to the clubs. Hey, it's Jake here with a really quick message. Please hit subscribe. It means we can grow the channel. It means we can attract incredible guests. It means that you get the chance to know about brand new episodes before anybody else. So before you go any further, hit subscribe. Please, just for me, right now. Thanks. Kodo, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. You've had an incredible career. You've done so many things, experienced so many things. Mm. So what do you believe high performance is? For me, high performance is, I will take that in, the, in my concept in uh, the industry that I'm working into, which is football. And I think that uh, uh, you can only talk about high performance when you, you work for, with people. You know, you need to have people with different uh, skill set, with the best to achieve uh, uh, the goals that you set as a team. Nice. So how do you go about getting people to buy into a certain way of operating and a certain way of thinking? I think the first thing is uh, you have to make sure you, uh, you bring them close to you. And I think for me, relationship, creating a, an open uh, uh, communication environment is very, very important because I want to create that trust between the players and, um, and, and me as a manager. And when I used to be a, a, a player as well, I always like to communicate a lot to, the, uh, to, to my teammates because when you create an environment where people feel, uh, feel happy, they feel like they, have, um, uh, they can express themselves you can you see like the they can give the best really. So when you were a player then, Colo, uh, where did you which environment allowed you to uh, express yourself the best? I would say Arsenal. You know, uh, I was very lucky uh, joining that uh, that team. And in that time, um, of course, we had few like French players in the team, and the manager was French as well. But you know, I was getting on very well with the English players as well, Martin Kiel, uh, Ray Paolo. Um, Saul Campbell, and these are guys that really helped me to, to get better, to, um, to improve myself and feel, feel, uh, that, uh, feel free, you know, to, to develop myself. And as we speak particularly about Martin Keown, he was huge for me because um, I was in competition with him and um, I didn't see somebody that was going, wanted to stop me. You know, I saw somebody who wanted to help me grow and that have allowed me really to, um, to play my best football, to don't be shy and to express myself. Because as you know, it's quite difficult when you're coming from Africa, you know. Uh, I was not talking the language very, very well, you know. Um, but I think the environment allowed me to progress. Well, let's talk about the man who created that environment then, yeah. Arsene Wenger. What was it like the, the first time you met him? It was incredible for me, you know, because he's, he was a friend of Jean Maguiot, which was the, the guy that created that academy where I came from, uh, Ivory Coast. And uh, I met him when we, we went for a tournament in, in, uh, in Holland, in Netherlands. And uh, we played against a few teams. We played against Ajax. We played against uh, Feyenoord. We played against uh, QPR, I remember. And seeing for, see him, him, you know, in life, for, for us, and especially for me, it was, like, it was incredible because I never thought, even in my, in my dreams, uh, you know, coming close to somebody like, like him because you only watch them in the TV, really, in that time, you know, could watch them on the TV and see them, like, managing the team. And when I came across him, it was, like, unbelievable, you know. You, you can't describe how happy I was. Nice. And you had a trial, right, at Arsenal? Yeah. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> 
<laughs> um, yeah, it was a funny <laughs> try, I can say, you know, very unusual try, I will say. Why? I was, I was too enthusiastic. I say, you know, I wanted to, uh, to sign for that club. I wanted to, um, to make sure that uh, I can get a contract, you know, and uh, I was thinking you cannot miss that chance, you know, to not uh, give your best inside for one of the best team in the world, you know, and uh, the adrenaline was there, but at the same time, I was thinking, boy, you have to give everything you got to stay there, definitely. So what happened? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just uh, in the in the game, you know. Um, the manager explained the rule, but because I was not speaking the language very well, as you can guess, uh, there is a moment where the ball goes out uh, of the of the pitch, and Arsene Wenger just run to go get the ball. But in my head, the game is 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 keeping going, and I just keep running, and at the same time, he turn, I tackle his, I tackle him with the ball. You know, Arsene Wenger. Yes, Arsene Wenger, <laughs> exactly. And that, uh, that was funny. That was really funny moment. Uh, but for me, it wasn't funny, I would say, because I was scared. Yeah. I was scared. Why were you scared? Scared to, uh, maybe he was going to be angry with me for, for what I'd done. Absolutely. Did you win the tackle? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but he then offered you a job. Yeah. And do you think that moment actually told him something about you? Yeah, I think so. What? Uh, I think so because uh, I think he saw somebody who, a boy that coming from another continent really, but uh, was willing to give everything to stay uh, and have a career in best country of football. Greatest tackle you ever made. Absolutely. When we interviewed Phil Neville a few years ago, Carlo, yeah. he, he spoke to us about how many young players, when they make that step up and maybe train with the first team, yeah. They're often inhibited or shy, and he felt it was those that had the courage to impose themselves or show themselves were, were the ones that gave themselves a fighting chance of having a career. Mm. So when you were in the changing room before you went out for that trial game, mm. what were the kind of conversations you were having with yourself? Because I've, I've been through a few tries, and uh, uh, I was in four clubs where it didn't work. And honestly, when I came to Arsenal, for me, I was thinking, what am I going to do there, really? You know, because I've been failing in four, like, small, you know, smaller clubs than Arsenal. I was thinking, okay, go there, give your best, and see what happened. That was, I think, <clears throat> but again, when I reflect, I think those try that I did uh, before helped me to be better in Arsenal. You know, it was almost like preparing myself for the, Big moment, yeah. You know, because I went to like Bastia, Strasbourg. Um, uh, I was in Bal in, in, I was in Bal. I was in Nandelect, and I think I played my best football in Arsenal. You know, I, and because I was much more free, you know, I, I was not putting a lot of pressure on myself, because I, you know, I'm, I'm quite. Uh, I like to be. Uh, I try to be perfect all the time. You know, and that, that was from the young age, you know, and, and uh, that's what I was trying to do in the previous, you know, tries. But when I went to Arsenal, I said to myself, okay, stay relaxed, give your best, and then see what happened. And it worked out well. Absolutely. Should we talk about what it's like to play in a team of invincibles? You've played in lots of different teams over lots of different seasons. Was there something special about that squad in that invincible season that you can put your finger on? Again, um, I will say that we were not on, uh, only uh, football players. We were not a team, we were brothers. Because we used to be, uh, to gel together a lot uh, outside, the, outside football. You know, I remember Patrick used to make party to his house, inviting everybody, his wife would cook some meal. From, uh, from Africa or from the Caribbean. And we all uh, used to go there and have food with our wives. And that, I think, create a, a bond in the team. And that's why for me, again, I go back to, for me, high performance is really um, having people with different skill sets, but working together and try to don't let each other down to, mm. to, uh, to win something. 
Hey, it's Jake here. Look, I just wanted to dive in very quickly to talk to you about travel counsellors. And this is particularly for people who are looking for maybe a big change in their life. So travel counsellors are a travel agent, a brilliant travel agent. I've booked my family holidays with them for the last few years. And that's the reason why I wanted to partner with them, because each travel counsellor is a passionate individual who believes in doing the very best for the customer. But each travel counsellor is also a business owner. They are their own boss. They have no limit to their earning potential. They work with over 2,000 other like-minded travel counsellors across six different countries, but as well as having an amazing opportunity to be self-employed, they also have the backing of an incredible business. They have world-class training. They have all the technology they need to deliver for the customer. So if you're looking to take control of your destiny, if you're looking for a change in your life, then maybe you should be looking to be a travel counsellor. For more information, just check out travelcounsellors.co.uk forward slash HPP. It might just be the most important thing you've ever done. But when you're in the middle of a game of football and it's an intense game, there's a lot happening and you're fighting for the win, what does being brothers do for you in that moment? You fight for your brother. You're not fighting for your teammate. You're fighting for your brother. If he does mistake, you have to cover. You know, and when you, when you have a a bond of, of uh, players who feel like that is incredible. The power is, is immense. Is, and, and I think that's, that was the strength of that team. We were fighting for each other. If you were to look back on you now, what were the characteristics beyond that obvious commitment? What was it that you think they saw that, as well as being a good footballer, they saw you as a, as a good person? What, what were those characteristics? I, I'm generous. Generous, you know, because... Um, I like to support people and sometimes I try to do too much, you know, and uh, that's the way I am. You How know, do you mean? I mean, um, I remember we played with Martin Keon and because Martin at one point was um, quite old player and for me, uh, playing with him at the back because he was such a nice man with me, you know, I, was, I wanted to just, you know, run around him you know, like covering him all the time, you know, because he was constantly talking to me, you know, and, you know, I, w I wanted to protect him because even though I was young, but I knew that he was lacking a little bit of speed and my strength was my speed. I could help him a lot in that, in that matter. And he was able to communicate a lot with me. And I think that's, you know, that created that, uh, uh, that uh, relationship really. And what I think is really interesting is when you came for your trial, the fact that you took the pressure off for yourself meant that you delivered. Yeah. But then in the Invincible season, you played almost every game. Mm. So suddenly there was pressure on you because you were a young player in yeah. a great team, edging towards winning the league. Yeah. So how did you, at such a young age, deliver under pressure? What were the mental games that you were playing and what were you saying to yourself? I think uh, w w uh, when I came and I watched the team, even at that age, I was analyzing the team and I was seeing that team of Arsenal, what was lacking at the back, you know, because um, uh, back in the days in the game, it was tall players, you know, especially centre-backs, they were quite tall. Martin Kuhn, Tony Adams, Saul Campbell. And I was thinking, what can I bring, you know, to that, to that team? And I was thinking, can bring my speed, I can bring my technique as well because I was quite good with the ball. And I always remember Patrick Vieira telling me, Kolo, get on the ball. You know, when Yancy may have the ball, he would ask me, Kolo, get on the ball. You know, because he knew that every time I was getting on the ball, I was able to break line of pass, pass the ball to him, or pass the ball to, uh, uh, to, to the side, or play the ball in this space for Thierry Henry, uh, for his speed. And I think they the Patrick allowed me really to express myself mm. because he knew what I was able to do and I knew what I was able to bring to the team too. Can we talk about as you edged towards winning the league as an invincible, what was it like with, I don't know, five games to go and you hadn't lost all season? What were the players saying? I think, honestly, when we start the season, we were not thinking about uh, being invincible or anything like that. And um, we just realized that we could do that when we won the league at, uh, at, um, at uh, uh, White Hat Lane. Right. And 
So how many games left was there after that? I think it was six, seven games, I think so. I can't remember right. exactly. And you thought at that point, we've done this? Yeah, exactly. We've done it. What next then? You know, and then we really start to realize, okay, we can do it. You know, but it wasn't something that we've been talking about. Right. You know, for me, I was young. Maybe as I had the conversation with Patrick, with the most senior players, but no with me. For me, I was thinking, let's try, you know, uh, try to win game after game. You know, and I can see, I can say that in the final game against against Leicester, I don't remember. I think that's where we stressed a little bit. You know, I think that we are the game was a bit strange. We didn't start well, but obviously we we won it, and then we we won uh, the, the trophy, and then we've been uh, invincible for that season. It was an incredible season. And Arsene Wenger is on record as talking about that you need at least seven leaders yeah. in a high performing team people that just set the standards. Can you give us examples of what the leaders in that team did to enforce and sustain the high standards? Patrick was, I would say, uh, the leader. Uh, uh, but Patrick is a guy that uh, he doesn't shout all the time. He will just shout at the right time. He leads a lot by example as well. He does things and you have to follow. I think uh, Thierry Henry, was he was a, he was a proper leader too, you know. He's leading from the front, but Thierry Henry is, I would say, like uh, at this time he wanted to be perfect. Thierry, with Thierry Henry, everything have to be perfect. You have to do everything to be perfect. And um, we had uh, Martin Keown who was not playing, but he was a guy that um, before a game will push the team. Come on, guys, let's do it. And I think we, it was not only the 11 players, it was the squad. You couldn't see like players on the bench hungry. Everybody was being the team. And that was massive. Ray Paolo, lovely man again, working hard at training. One thing I will say, like with this team, which I felt like was the key, it was training. The intensity of training was incredible. Honestly, I did trainings there and I was like, I was tired after. I was thinking, oh, wow, such a tough training. And you go to the game on Saturday, the game is much easier because you've been training uh, with a high standard. And, and when you transfer that to the game, you, 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 you work on your other team, definitely. And let's talk about Arsene Wenger at this point then. You know, you tackled him on day one, got the contract from him, great. But at this point, you really get an understanding of why Arsene Wenger is one of the greatest coaches the game has ever seen. And we see the tactics and we see the media afterwards, and, but you see so much more. So why do you think Arsene Wenger managed to do what he did at Arsenal? I think Arsene Wenger, um, nowadays we, we can see the modern managers, um, they talk a lot tactically. You know, they you know, give a lot of information to the players you know, a winger coming inside to create some overload on the middle with four players versus three. Arsene Wenger will not talk about that, but he will pick the players which were able to do that job. You know, because if you see our team, we had, we had Freddie Jumbeng on the right side, we had Robert Pires on the left side. And what uh, Freddie's job was running in the space all the time, if you remember. He scored many goals like that. Robert Pires, because he was almost like a number 10, he used to drift from the middle to create the overload there. And I think that's what Arsene Wenger was doing, you know, bringing players together with different qualities to get uh, the, 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 uh, the, the high performance, really. You know, he knew how to, how to pick his players and put them on the pitch without talking a lot. What he used to say a lot to us, because we used to batter team, you know, uh, in the first half, and sometimes when it's nearly, say, stay calm, stay patient, keep putting the pressure, the goal will come. And that was his word. And we always used to score goals, you know, in the second half, definitely. So would he focus, so how much of his focus on a game would be on the opposition and how much of it would just be focusing on what you could do? He, he focusing in us, he used to focus a lot in us. You know, we do a little bit about the opposition team, but most most of his uh, like um, meetings was on us, what we were capable of doing. And I always think 
you know, one thing is getting to the player's head, which is the tactics. What did Arsene Wenger used to do to get to the player's hearts? He's such a nice man, honestly. You know, I never saw Arsene just being, being uh, aggressive with a player or shout anything. I never saw that. You know, he's, the way he was leading was quiet. And he would always speak, he talk to the players on his office. You know, and uh, he was such a, a strange man. You know, you, you, you see him every morning coming, say hi to everyone. You know, and then you don't see him again. You know, he was leaving the players um, almost like uh, dictate the area. But I would say like he had really experienced players. You know, when you have Dennis Bergkamp, you have uh, Martin Keown, Uri Paolo, Patrick Vieira. These are, they were mains. Because I thought he would have been there all the time. Do this, do that, don't do it. No? No. Such a quiet man, honestly. Such a quiet man. And can you recount any occasion where he did call you in his office and what was his feedback and the impacts of that for you? I do I remember talking a lot to him. I was, uh, because my, my culture, you don't talk a lot to your, um, to your father. Yeah. You know, your father speak to you. He call you. You don't go to him most of the time. And I, and I was no player which was go in the office and try to talk. Asun will approach me because he knew I was young and he knew my culture. You know, he knew that uh, in Africa, you know, you have to be really respectful of the elders. You know, this is really, really important. And for me, I grew up there and I had that. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, I came here, but still I have it. You know, and he knew that. And he was always calling me, talking to me. Most of the time on the pitch, you know, after training, pull me, speak to me. And that's, uh, that's the moment where I was talking a lot to him. What was he like when you were late coming out for the second half of your Champions League game? <laughs> I mean, I think you should probably explain the story for people first before we talk about Arsene's reaction. You know, what, what I used to do, honestly, you know, for me, I'm a Muslim, you know, and before that um, I go on the pitch, I have to do my, my wudu, you know, is like taking my ablution, you know, uh, as, a, as a Muslim, you... you before you pray, you have to watch yourself in a certain way. And I always used to do that. And for me, that was important to do that for my mindset to go on the pitch and deliver, you know, and it doesn't matter what happened, I had to do it. And uh, I, think, I think that day, that's what happened. I went to do my Udu and then I came late, you know, and uh, again, Aston Wenger, really quiet man, you know, he will, he will never shout on you anything like that. I, you, I knew he was hungry with me and I was trying to, to don't, not do it again. So if he doesn't shout, yeah. how does he show his displeasure? I would say he just, uh, you can see his face change a little bit, you know, but he would never like uh, really shout, I would say. You know, when you look at him, he will be like, you know, you do a little sign on his face and you know you, you got things wrong. And for a man who achieved so much, what was it like watching by then from the outside yeah. as he came towards the end of his time at Arsenal and it got quite toxic and yeah. quite negative. How did, you, how did you feel about that? I felt bad, you know, to be honest, because I think he doesn't deserve that. Yeah. But I would say, like, Arsene Wenger was used to really experienced players around him. You know, he didn't have to talk too much, but when you start having a lot of young players in your team, you need to get on them. You know, you need to be able to tell them everything. You know, you need to be on the toe all the time yeah. and I think that's what happened you know at one point with Arsenal you know all the experienced players were uh, uh, all of them were gone you know we were all gone really and Arsen had some young players in front of him and I think for me in any team you need some some experience you need some leaders there players who've been in the club for maybe 10 15 years you know and the young players uh, just they just copy them they, they follow them they look what they do and I think Asen Wenger suffered on, on that, uh, in my opinion. Do you ever speak to him now? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Do you? Yeah. My father. Give uh, me my first opportunity here, you know, for, for, for in our continent, you know, is don't, you know, it doesn't matter what happened, but uh, never forget what people done to you, you know. And for me, uh, I call him my father, really. He's, uh, uh, he's the one who gave me the opportunity to, to express myself in the biggest league in the world. You so know? lovely. Yeah. And, uh, so, so if there was a trait 
from him that you would take into your yeah. own managerial career? Yeah. What would that be? Trust young players. Um, give ownership to the players. Um, uh, because when I was young again, when I came, he, he really he trusted me. He was not scared to throw young players in the team. And that's why he ended up with a lot of young players at one point, you know. And uh, I would say um, he's, he's such a calm guy, but at the same time, he's a, he's a proper leader who um, he's, he's somebody that you want to work hard for him. You know, because the way he treats you, treats you very nicely. So let's talk about the next club you went to in English football after Arsenal. I mean, I suppose, first of all, did you want to leave Arsenal? <laughs> Good question. No, I didn't want to leave Arsenal, but I want when you, at one point you became to be a, it started to be a little bit toxic, you know, because other players coming and they have, they come in with different mindsets, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, especially when you play at the back and, uh, you don't, don't get on very well with people, it's quite difficult. Because, like I said, Arsenal again, Arsenal is about togetherness. And when did that start to change? Uh, other players coming around, which uh, they, they had different, um, different mindset, really. And I couldn't cope with that, you know, because for me, football is about being together, working hard together, protecting together. So what does toxic behaviours look like in a football club? A selfishness. You know, it, it, for me, if you want to be able to win trophies, you have to work for each other. Mm. You know, if you have one or two players on the pitch who pick moment of ha working hard for the team, you know, you won't get anything. And were you not able to go to the manager and say, solve the problem? Um, I, I think there is moment in the club where, as a player, you feel powerful and everybody knows that uh, you... You're in the position of leading, and there is a moment where you start to be a little weak, you know, and that when that happens, you can figure that out very quickly. And the trust starts to go to somebody else, you know, and as soon as you get to somebody else, there's no there's no drama. You have to realize that you remove yourself, and that's what I did for the benefit of the club, you know. Really? Yeah, absolutely. So you went to Manchester City. Yeah. Talk us through the day that you walked into that dressing room for the first time, because every club has a different culture. Yeah. What did you walk into? Watch a different area, <laughs> differently. <laughs> yes. Back in the days, it was, uh, Man City was a club with, uh, who wanted, uh, who had big ambitions uh, with the new uh, chairman uh, who came. Uh, they wanted to achieve great things and they started bringing players. But when I went there, I saw a group of players, very nice guy. Uh, it was Vincent, it was uh, Nigel De Jong. They were really nice people, I would say, nice guy. But you could see that they were no use to winning mentality. You know, and from first training, I remember, we did a rondo, you know, rondo in yeah. uh, 8v2. And when we do the rondo, when you do the rondo with Arsenal, it's quite serious. You know, you don't want to lose the ball. And then in Man City, we do the rondo and then there's a moment where I think there is a, uh, when you put the ball in, in on, uh, on the feet of a player. Not Mac. Not Mac, exactly. Um, and then everybody starts shouting and kicking the ball away and then laughing. I was like, oh, <laughs> very strange, not used to that, you know. When you do not Mac, you just keep going, you know. You laugh a little bit, but it was like very loud and very, I was like, okay, we have to make sure we change the mindset. You know, because if you want to be winning mentality, we need to, when you make a nod, the game is not finished. You have to score the goal, you know, and, and uh, you know, that was the difference. And I knew that we need to change that as a team. So how did you go about changing the mindset at Manchester City? Uh, being serious, don't laugh. You know, when they were used to do that, I was like, you know, guys, come on, you have to carry on doing it, you know, because uh, playing a nod is nice, but it doesn't win your games, doesn't make you score goals. You know, and when, when you, you know, one of the senior players coming, they see that mm, he's not laughing, you know, that means he's not having it. Yeah. You know, and slowly, so start changing the mentality. And it was Mark Hughes that recruited you. Yeah. Did he give you permission to go and change the culture? He never gave me the permission. I was going to take it, definitely. You know, because they, I was a captain when I came there. 
And for me, it was no way that I was coming from Arsenal and then just come in, in, in the club and just let things happen. See, again, I, I was thinking of the parallels with Phil Neville, again, repeating the, the interview with him. He spoke about when he went to Everton, David Moyes appointed him as captain. Yeah. And he said he actually found it very difficult because he hadn't proven himself to that dressing room. And yet you were given that status from the start. Mm -hmm. Was there challenges in having to establish yourself as the leader? Absolutely. Absolutely. There were challenging and uh, challenges, sorry. Um, Donny was there. Um, I think he was, uh, he was the captain as well there. And I think uh, I, had, I, had, I had to take the captaincy on one point. And it, it was difficult for a guy like him. He was in the club for a long time. Richard Dunn was the captain. Great guy, you know, a great leader. But I came and then I had to, they had to make decisions. You know, you have to make decisions if you want to move forward, you know. And when I had the, the captaincy, it was, it was great, but it was really heavy. You know, like you say, you know, you find people there, you know, and difficult to get to bring them close to you. But... Uh, I think the one thing I had it was dedication, hard work. I work hard at training. You know, for me, I give everything at training. And when people around see that you're serious, you're working hard, you care about the club, you care about them, um, they start following you, they start trust you. So did you go and speak to Richard and sort of have a conversation about what had happened? Uh, no, no. Because, he, he, you know, it happened to me at one point as well, you know, uh, they give the, the handband to... Uh, Tevis, yeah, you know, and uh, uh, yeah, and that's the way it goes, you know. Sometimes you feel like, oh, you know, why are you taking that to me? But uh, this is the game, you know. It's about, um, it's about what uh, the leader believe, you know. When the believer believe that this guy is the guy who can lead the team, he's doing it. He's and, doing it. and when the armband was removed from you and given to Carlos Tevez, yeah. what did you do? Did you protest? Did you complain? Did you speak to the manager? Like. Well, I was very angry. <laughs> Were you? Yeah, absolutely. I was very angry and uh, it's never pleasing. It's never pleasing. What did you say? My reaction was, uh, I was not happy at all, but I couldn't do much as well. And, uh, but I was very, very unhappy. But again, you, you get on very quickly because there's game coming, you know, and you have to move quickly to the next one, definitely. And when, when you first arrived at City and you were, you were the captain, because this is useful for people who are not in football, but they're in business or they're teachers, parents, whatever. Those players who you sensed weren't having you as a captain, mm -hmm. how did you deal with them? Um, I think you have to convince him by the way you carry yourself, by making sure that you train well, you deliver on the pitch, you know, and then they have no choice, they have to follow you. And were you the kind of captain that wanted one-to-one -one conversations with players? Uh, no. No, I was more leading by example, not talking too much, you know, but more like working at the training. For me, training is, is the base of everything. You know, if you are the leader and you're not working hard at training, players see that, you know, and the level of the team drops straight away. So James Milner told us that he, that he always saw himself and Jordan Henderson as good cop, bad cop. So he saw himself as being the guy that imposed standards. If you were late, he'd be issuing fines. And then Jordan would be the guy that would put their arm around the shoulder and encourage you not to be late next time. What were you as a captain? Um, good question. Uh, I would say for me, I was more... Um, I could do both. I could do both because I can have tough conversation as well. You know, because I'm quite demanding, you know, when I used to be play, to, to play. Because I was, quite, I was quite vocal as well. You know, speak a lot to the players. But I will give them that as well, you know. But I think everything you do, you have to do it in the respective way. You know, when you communicate with somebody, come on, man, come on, you know, push, do more, you know. But at the same time, when he, when he does something well, well done, yeah. keep going, perfect. You know, when you give them those two uh, different uh, um, feelings, they feel, they feel appreciated because you never give only the 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 bad one yeah you give the good one as well and was there a moment then as captain when you felt you did start to get the dressing room coming behind you and standards started to improve absolutely absolutely because we we had new players coming you know we had yaya silva 
you know, those players were used to the top level, you know, as well. And uh, when they came, they make things much more easy, you know, because the, the standard that they had, they just carry that, they bring that in the club, you know, and the guys that, uh, that are fine there, they start to raise the level, you know, and if you look, at one point, Vincent became the captain, you know, um, uh, Les Scott uh, became one of the best players, and both of them playing in front of me, you know, because that's what competition bring. You bring the standard, and the other one, you feel like, oh, the, the standard is no, they start to raise the standard, nice. and then boom, they pass you. And at one point, I was not starting the games, you know, but this is the competition. And when you get to any environment, that's what you need to do. You need to push pe people to go above what they, they expect and what they think they can do. And you spoke about the brotherhood that you had at Arsenal. You literally did have your brother joining you at Manchester City. What was, it, what was that like for you as a leader? Oh, it was special. It was special. It was, for me, it was the best moment of my career, I would say. You know, having Yaya with me, you know, and I always talk about that, but you know, he, he never mentioned that, but he could have gone to the other side of the of the city, you know, and I tell him, listen, could, yeah, yeah, come to us. Could you he know? have joined United? Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, you know, because it was speculation, yeah. from Chelsea, United, and he was thinking, oh yeah, maybe United can be good because of the standard, you've been winning. I said, come with us, you know, if you can with, with, uh, with Mount City. Uh, you know, there's so many things to achieve here. Because if you go to United, they achieve so many things there. You know, you never be a legend. But if you come to City and you do, we do well, you'll be a legend here. And that's what happened. And that's what make me even prouder. You know. I'm so sorry, man. Colo <laughs> stopped his brother joining your football club. I'm smiling, but I'm crying inside here. <laughs> Look, you were a real, a true professional. You led by example. You were a captain. Mm -hmm. So would you tell us in, with real honesty, how mm -hmm painful it was when you were banned for six months for, for substance abuse? It was hard. It was really, really hard. What was the l toughest moment? <sighs> not playing games. Not playing games. I was able to train. And uh, as well, you know, when you know that you haven't done, um, of course, you know, it, there's, there, you know, for them is, is people talk about drugs, you know, but I'm thinking, you know, it's better to use another word, you know, mm. because my kids now think that that took a drug, yeah. you know, and when drug in, you know, in French or I don't know, is like cocaine or things like that, you know, but I was, uh, I took a, a diuretic, you know, in uh, diuretic is just to flush the water, really, yeah. you know, and, but, you know, the way it's been, so, you know, it's been in, the, you know, in the media, I was like, oh my God. You was know? that almost the most, because let's just be clear for people that don't yeah. know the story. Yeah. It was a tablet put into water to flush your system and the prosecutor said, at no time did you take any performance enhancing substance. However, yeah. what you did take yeah. meant you failed the drugs test, right? So was it almost the embarrassment of people thinking that you were taking a performance enhancing drug that was the hard? Or any drug. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, because you think that I don't need that at all. You know, and for me, it was to prove that I didn't need to take something like that, you know. And, uh, and that's why when I came back, you know, I was very hungry to show more, you know. And, uh, but it's difficult. It's very difficult time. And, uh, but uh, again, that's part of the game. You know, you have setbacks. And when you have setbacks, you have to fight and wake up and then carry on going, you know, <laughs> you know. We, we can't talk about your time at City without talking about Aguero <laughs> and 2012. Absolutely. What are your memories of, of that day? I we said um, that day I was not in the team. Um, again, it's difficult, uh, very, very difficult when you are not in the team, of course, mm. because you're a competitor, you want to be on the pitch. You know, after being banned, you know, I think I fight my way to come back. It was really, really hard. The players established themselves. They were playing very, very well. But again, I will say it was all about the project. You know, um, coming to City was a challenge for every player who came in the club. And 
when uh, Aguri scored that goal, you know, deep inside you feel like, you know, I'm part of it. I'm part of a, a big moment, big uh, story in in uh, Man Manchester City life, and we'll always be remembered. And I think that's uh, that was my feeling, you know. I said, okay, Kulu, you left Arsenal. Everybody was talking, yeah, he left for the money, for the blah, blah. But when we won it, it was like almost, you know, I made the right decision to move because I helped that team to, to win a trophy. And for a team like Manchester City that hadn't won the league in such a long time, what do you feel mentally you brought to them that enabled them to get over the line for that first time? I think it was um, the belief the belief because to win a trophy you need to believe that's the first thing because at the start of the season is everybody in the same line when you have players who won it before you know they they will carry you there they will take you there and that's what happened really we just bring belief to the fans belief to the clubs so then eventually your time at Manchester City comes to yeah. an end you didn't want to leave Arsenal did you want to leave Man City at this point you know I was feeling a bit disappointed a little bit because I, f I felt like the trust that the club have put on me, I don't think I have given back really because of all, all the things happened to me. Mm. And uh, I wanted to, you know, have another opportunity because Pellegrini came and I felt like, okay, if Pellegrini come, maybe I will have more opportunities, I will have more chance to play. But unfortunately, they didn't want to carry. And, uh, and then, you know, what happened next? So did you have a choice of clubs when you left City? Um, I was scared. I was scared, honestly. I was thinking, mm, where are you going? I was thinking maybe go to France. And then uh, I had a phone call from the big man, from the Norwegians. I was delighted, honestly. When I, so take a, us back to that moment. Where oh were God. you? I was home. I was home and then uh, uh see my phone. Um, and then Brandon Rogers on the phone. You know, I was like, oh my God. Um, what did he say? He said to me, listen, Kolo, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm thinking about, thinking about having you in my team, everything with your experience. And uh, I said to him, boss, okay, no problem. Uh, one thing I will tell you, I will, uh, um, I, will, I, will, I will never let you down. You know, that's what I tell him, you know, because uh, I told him that straight away. And how quickly does a conversation go from you and him chatting on the phone? Yeah to you pulling on a, a Liverpool top for a photo for the first time. How quick was that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's not that quick because you have to go through uh, medical, you know, in that tough moment as well because you never know what can happen there. Uh, I remember I went to, the, to Melwood at that moment. and uh, uh, So did you go straight to Melwood after the phone call? No, it took a little bit of time. Right. And then, um, uh, you know, took time and then I went uh, and that it was a day where there's no one in training ground and I was on my own watching there, you know, looking. It was different training ground from where I used to be, you know, because it was like, uh, uh, you have houses around and then the training ground is inside. And it was really, it was a good moment, you know, I watch, I see like the photo and I start to realize that I was going to sign for one of the biggest clubs in, in England again. Really fortunate for me. I'm really taken by that line that you used to Brendan though around I won't let you down why was that such an important promise to make yeah because I was in the moment where people was doubting on me on me and uh, I was doubting on me too you know because as a man you when you are set back you start doubting on yourself which is normal if you don't doubt yourself in those moments that's mean you I don't think you you know um, you are human really I would say uh, when he said that to me, it was the way for me to reassure him. But at the same time, it was a way for me to say, like, come on, Kolo, this guy will put uh, his trust on you and you have to, back, you have to really, um, you have to make sure you don't disappoint him. Again, you go back to what I say, you know, when people trust me, I feel responsible to make things happen. And that's my nature. So you won the league at Arsenal. Yeah. Won the league at Manchester City. Yeah. Two incredible clubs. Yeah. But there are very few things in football like running out at Anfield in front of the cop wearing the red of Liverpool. Take us to the day that you did that. That was incredible. Honestly, what the club, 
Yeah, what a club. Unbelievable. Playing in front of the cup is... Wow. First game, I will say, first game playing against uh, Stoke. And I uh, had pressure on me because I was... I could see like the environment, you know, the fans were not sure, Colo How could you old. tell they were not sure? You see the press, people talking, you know, and even you see fans and uh, you don't see them really enthusiastic to see you, really. They're thinking, oh, maybe it's, it's, this time is gone, maybe you won't do well for the club. And uh, for me, that game was important, you know, to show from the first minute. And I remember there is a moment, and Brandon talk always about that, and I can remember that moment it was incredible in the game. Long ball, I think from the goalkeeper, um, and then I'm fight, um, in duels with Peter Crouch. You know, Peter Crouch really tall. I'm thinking like, listen, you will win that ball, hundred percent, to make sure that to give to all the fans the sign that you are here. I went high and I won the ball. And I, can, I could hear the fans, like, you know, I could see like, they were whoo, they were shocked. Because you know, Peter is really tall and to win the ball on his head is quite difficult. Honestly, I jumped, I was, I was amazed by my jumping. You know, I was like, wow, how did you do that? But again, that was the emotion that I was carrying, um, the willingness to, to show to the fans that I'm the man, you know, and I think that action changed the view of all the Liverpool fans. So how much of the success of your career then, when you talk about imposing your will, making it happen for you, how much of what you did in your career was up here and how much was physical? I think everything was there. Everything was there, you know, it doesn't matter where you come from, how tall you are, how fit you are. I think when you have the willingness to get something, you, you find resources. In your head, mentally? Mentally, exactly. What was your greatest moment in a Liverpool shirt, do you think? Wow. I would say, like, uh, we haven't won, you know, the trophy, but the final of the Europa League, mm. it was incredible. incredible. We lost the game. We lost the game, but I was really, really proud because for me to be able to play that final was a challenge because I was in competition with really good players. And at that age, and, uh, we lost, but we give everything. And did you see that Liverpool squad and that manager and think, in the future, something great is going to happen here? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You Why? could see that. What could you see? It's lovely, man. He's a lovely man. He's, he's a leader. He's somebody that you want to fight. You want to work for him. You don't want to let him down. Klopp. Yeah. You don't want to let him down. He's when you join when when he came in, into the club and you shake his hand, he doesn't shake your hand like everyone, like managers. Shake you like it like a mate. You know, in I think that's he created that, um, that trust straight away. And you feel part of his family straight away. And I think he's, what he's doing now, and I have no surprise, you know, he's, he's a lovely, lovely man. What did he say to, to bring the players on the journey with him early on? Do you remember the first time you, you saw Jurgen Klopp address the players and think, I like, I like what I see here? Again, I would say about the way he shake your hand. Just that first impression. First impression. He shake your hand like a teammate, you know, and he's, I would say the, the things that I think was the key for all the success for Liverpool, I think Milner spoke about that a little bit. That was the moment where we lost that final, you know, the um, Europa League final, yeah. that moment. You know, we are all down, you know, we lost the game. Everybody was like, you know, in the party, and then we were, you know, why are we doing, why are we doing there in the party? We lost the game. You know, we saw the manager walking up there in the middle and dancing, and then walking around, pulling everybody, come dance. 
You know, I was like, why is this guy is crazy? What is he doing? You know, but he ended up to be one of the best parts he had been to, honestly. You know, he made us forget about that moment. And I think his strength is a guy that he never carry negative things. You know, he let things go. You know, you could see he lost a game yesterday. You know, in his comments, he said like, we, they perform well. Mm. You know, he will never get hungry to the players when they give everything. And I think that is strength that. So you've been in title winning dressing rooms. You've played for some of the iconic managers of our time. How important is a manager? If you had to allocate a percentage to it. Wow. Um, I will really say like 70%. Wow. Yeah, 70% because uh, your manager is the one who bring the cohesion. The manager is the one who bring the strategy. And the manager is, is there to motivate the players. And when you do all those, uh, when you do all those three things, you're inspiring them, you know. And I think manager is very, you know. People sometimes talk about yeah, top players. Yes, top. You need to have a good squad, absolutely. But it's how you get the best from the players, you know. And I think people think uh, as well. People talk about Pep Guardiola, and people see him as a top manager. And people say yeah, he has good players. Yes, he has good players. But what he does best. You get the best from those players. Each Man City player play with the the full potential every single game, you know. And and that's not for one game; it's every game. He's pushing them to the stream, you know. And I think that's what I believe that if you have a manager who's quite uh, who doesn't inspire you enough. You know, you never reach your full potential. Because football players like to be relaxed, like to be tranquil. Like everybody, you don't want to work too hard and achieve things. You know, and, but when you have a manager who push you hard, and, you know, you, you, you can end up achieve things that you don't think even you could be able to do. Then there was a lovely moment where you were able to end your career by joining another huge club. I mean, you've basically <laughs> played for every famous club in the UK, nearly. Um, you went to Celtic and you were an invincible once more. How special was that at a time in your career when you would have been well aware that there weren't many games left? Yes, absolutely. There were no many games, definitely. Um, joining uh, Celtic was for me uh, I was going there because of Brandon Rogers, you know. Um, I was following Celtic a little bit, but not overly, I have to be honest. And when I joined there, I was like, I'm not sure what I was going to see there. And I went to the training ground, I see the people, I see the fans, and I was, it, was, it was incredible. The passion, it was incredible. They love the club. They love the club yeah. and the, uh, the competition between Rangers and Celtic is, is, there's no many like that because it's religious, I would say. Yeah. They don't like each other. They hate each other. So how do you deal with a rivalry like that as a footballer? What's the, what's the best way to get the best out of yourself in that really red hot atmosphere? Win, win games. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> win football matches. Especially in Scotland. Especially in Scotland. Make sure you win the title. Yeah. Make sure you win every single game you play against them. And I will say that um, when I joined the, the, team, uh, the team, it was his first time when Ron just came up from relegation. Oh, yeah. You know, and I think we, we battered them 5-1. You know, it was a good game. I played that game, by the way. It was intense. It was, uh, it was a really good game. Uh, we played very well. And at the end of the game, I was driving my car and I see like the police on the middle of the road and I saw two sets of fans. You know, was what, uh, some fans on the left and on the right. And uh, it was, you know, Rangers and Celtic fans wanted to fight each other. And I was driving there. I was like, oh, come on, turn quickly and then drove to go to the other way. And um, 
yeah, it was uh, incredible, incredible moment in, in, in Scotland. And at this stage of your career, Carl, how, how did you keep your motivation levels high? It, it's difficult when you, um, uh, when you feel like you're losing your, your, your strength. And because I was a powerful player and I was somebody winning my duels all the time when I used to play, um, I was suffering inside me because I was suffering, suffering in trainings, intensity. I couldn't cope with intensity anymore. I was get passed by young players. Yeah. I was hating in that, you know, and I was thinking, you got to make sure, boom. You Do know? you remember the moment that you decided to retire? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's a game, I remember there's a game. Um, I think we were doing like the in, in, um, Invincible. In, in, uh, we had a break, I think in December. And then we came back and uh, I remember having the conversation with Brandon and he would say, Colo, do you think you'll be able to play that game? And uh, we had uh, a young player, Dede Boyota. He was doing, he done very well at training that week before we start the second part of the season. I was thinking, Colo, you have to make sure you don't, <laughs> you don't play that game and, you know, you, uh, you, 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 you make the team lose, you know, because I don't think I was in my full potential right. because we but did you the thought training. If you'd have played, the team would have exactly. lost. Exactly. And did you say that to Brendan? I never said that to him. And he asked me and I was like, I said to him, listen boss, play that player. I said, play that young player. And uh, I think as a, as a human, you have, you have to know your limitation. Yeah, yeah. You have to know. You know, sometimes our ego try to push you and then, you know, because we want to be the one who have everything. But there's moment you have to realize. And I realized that moment I was thinking, let this boy play. He's doing very well at training. He's, he's fit. Just give him this chance. And again, you go back to Martin Keown. I was going to say, yeah. You know, Martin Keown supported me when I came. He never, he never uh, stopped me developing myself. And I was thinking, no, I don't want to stop this young boy development. And I had conversation with that boy. Third week, he was down. He was thinking, oh, I'm not playing, blah, blah. I said, okay, stay calm. You know, I stay calm. And I said to him, I was so honest with him, you know. I said, listen, I'm playing because I have the manager, you know, I have more experience. He respect me a lot because of my experience. But stay calm, you're going to play. How lovely, though, that after well, all these you years, know, circle, you were yeah. able to give back as Martin Keogh. Exactly, you know. Back and, to you. and that's that's that was my feeling, yeah. you know. And I was thinking, okay, done, you know, for me. Yeah. No energy anymore, you know. Um, just leave the boys and then his career. The day comes where you pull on a football jersey and put on a pair of boots for the final time as a player. Yeah. What were your emotions that day? You know, you again I had I have I have no regret at all because I felt like I empty myself. Yeah. You know, mentally and physically. You know, I give everything. Because for me, again, I told you, one thing is training. And when I felt like, you know, at training, I was not giving my best. I was no, um, I was letting down my teammate in a small side game, you know, <laughs> you know. I was like, no, done, done. And, uh, you know, I'm very proud of the career that I'm done because I felt like I give everything and I always try to be honest with myself. In my teammate. And we're talking to Colo Torre, the manager now, rather than Colo Torre, the player. You've had your first managerial job at Wigan. Yeah. It lasted a few weeks, a few games. Yeah. How painful was that experience and how much did you learn? Um, again, uh, my pain was letting people down, you know, because I had the, the trust from the chairman, from the fans. Um, from the people at, at Wigan, you really, uh, from the CEO. And uh, unfortunately, the strategy that I've used, I've not worked. What was the strategy? My strategy was, um, I had this style of play in my head and tried to implement that. But, you know, I learned that it's not about you really, it's about the players. It's about what they are capable of or doing. You know, and I was really fortunate to play with 
clubs who, who wanted to win every matches, uh, teams who want to win the trophy. And I've never been in that environment of fighting for relegation. Mm. And when I went there, I wanted to, to impose uh, things that I've been learning in the winning mentality environment. Uh, it was difficult for the boys, you know. And again, I have to be honest to myself, and, and, uh, and uh, the, thing, the positive thing is I learned so much from that moment. I learned so much because I... Um, I know now if I go to another opportunity, it's all about you. It's about people we're going to find there, what they are capable of doing. And I think that's the biggest learning for me there. So it hasn't, it hasn't dulled your desire to be a manager? It hasn't put you off the job? Like when I did my try in Anderlecht, in Strasbourg, in Bâle, you know, for me, it, it gave me more strength you know, I can't wait to go for another opportunity because I know that I have a lot to give to the game. You know, I don't want to be sit home or um, and don't give what, uh, what, I, what I learn and don't give my, uh, my inspiration, don't give my, my energy. You know, when I watch football matches, you know, I just, I, I try to analyze everything. You know, I watch African Nation, you know, I watch almost every single game. I had my notebook, you know, on the TV and try to note what if I, when I was, uh, if I was the manager of Nigeria, for example, or five records, what I was going to tell my players, you know. And for me, football is not a job, it's a passion. Yeah. You know, and, you know, when I used to play, I told you I used to talk a lot, you know, and that's the way I am. I like to inspire a team to win. And even any player will tell you, even in a small side game, you know, as soon as the game starts, boom, I'm on it. You know, I want to win it. You know, and uh, because I, I had that all my life for 20 years, I just want to carry having that, you know, and that's the feeling I have now. So for a CEO, a football club owner, a director of football, if they're listening to this conversation, why should they pick up the phone to Colo Torre next time they have an, a, a, uh, an opportunity for a manager? Because I'm honest. And I will defend the club. I will inspire the players. I will make them work hard and uh, to, fo to win football matches. And I will give everything, you know, for, for the club to be successful, you know, because you can always give, only give your best, you know, and that's what I'm going to do, you know, work hard for that football club. I'd give you the job. But sadly, I don't have one to offer. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, if I did, I would. Um, we've reached the point where we're going to do some really fast, quick-fire questions with you now. Okay. So, what are the three non-negotiable behaviours that are really important to you? Uh, for me, respect. I would say respect is very, um, is very important, in, uh, especially in the, in the team environment. Mm. You know, you can uh, respect between each other, between the players, respect between players and staff, respect in, in the canteen, everywhere. You know, when people are respectful, they really, um, you create a good environment and people looking forward to go to that environment. Yeah. Number two, I will say discipline, you know, because as a manager, if you just put a strategy, uh, you want every player to really buy into it and play their role. You know, and I think it's very, very important to have this be nowadays in the game. You know, you cannot have players who just do whatever they want, you know. And uh, that's why for me, discipline is very important. And the third one? Commitment. You know, I will say commitment because, you know, um, you know, you have, you, for me, as a player, when you sign for a club, you have to make sure you work hard for that club. And it doesn't matter if you are, you know, you picked or you're not picked. You know, for the matches, you have to give your best, you know, and because you are part of a group and there's a moment where you're going to step up and somebody will sit down and that person needs to support you and create that, you know, that uh, brotherhood is so important. Brilliant. What advice would you give to a teenage colo just starting out? Um, I would say, 
I will say, control your emotion, I will say, because I'm quite an emotional guy, you know, and you learn that, you know, you learn that um, uh, with experience, you know, um, you have to make sure you just, um, if you're not happy, you stay calm, uh, think before you can speak, very important. Um, and that's, uh, that's what I'm going to say to me, definitely. What's your biggest strength, Colo? And what's your greatest weakness? My biggest strength, I would say, um, um, I'm positive, and I don't know where that comes from. You know, I'm, I always see a, a positive thing out of nothing, you know. It doesn't matter which problem we are in, I will feel positive. I will have the energy to go and push, you know, I don't know where that come from. And your greatest weakness? Can be, can be uh, too nice sometimes, um, in my opinion, a little bit. I think people will say, um, uh, it's not a weakness, but I think you have to know how to manage it. Yeah. And the final question is, what's your one golden rule to live a high performance life? Give your best every single day. Have no regret in everything you do. Wonderful. What a great conversation. And I would love one day to see you as the Ivory Coast manager lifting the Africa Cup of Nations with the players all around you, hey? World Cup. Ah, I love it. <laughs> the World Cup. Perfect. World Cup and Africa Cup of Nations. Boof. <laughs> you know what? Inshallah. If good things happen to good people, then that will come your way because um, you absolutely deserve it. And I know what you mean by sometimes you can be too nice, but it's far better to get to the end of your life and people say he was too nice than people say he was too nasty. So thanks a lot. No, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.